A 33-year-old woman completely disappears, and the ensuing investigation uncovers a criminal underworld. Every lead, another suspect. And despite using the best science has to offer, there is little to find in evidence. In this case, the missing piece is key, and the science of pathology explains the absence of evidence in Operation Wesley. A crime scene is a puzzle that has to be solved. A whodunit, a scattering of clues to be deciphered by clever detective work and the power of science. Police detectives are visiting an Auckland motel as part of their inquiries into a missing woman, 33-year-old Ray Portman. According to bank records, this was one of her last expenses, a room booked for the night of June the 20th. Staff remember her because she checked in, but never checked out. The night of the 20th, she never returned to that motel. Uh, it was clear from the officers that attended there that the bed uh, it hadn't been disturbed and everything was in place. It's now two weeks since she was last seen, and the room holds no clues as to what has happened to her. But she has left a lot of items behind, which staff kept aside. Why does a woman disappear without any of her belongings? Among her personal items, detectives discover a bottle with an unusual substance. It's Contact NT, a precursor drug used in the manufacture of methamphetamine, or P. As well, there are other drug-related items. It seemed missing Ray Portman had secrets. I felt quite naive. Ray kept her personal life to herself. Um, when she did come and visit home, she would let you know little bits that she thought you might like to know about, but she kept things pretty close to her chest. The Ray that I knew, she had a great sense of humour, loved the animals, enjoyed her cooking. She was really good at cooking as well. I had to get a real crash course through the CIB to explain to me exactly what P was and the extent of P in the underworld which Ray was involved in. I just couldn't understand how she could do that. Nothing was how it seemed with Ray Portman's life. We were able to establish that her last activity on the phone was polling out of Tarapa in Hamilton. It was at 5.30 a.m. on the 21st of June. And from then on, that phone never went again. The last call was never answered. So why was her phone polling in Hamilton when she had booked a motel in Auckland that night? Was it to go home and see her boyfriend, who she lived with in Hamilton? He was very upfront about their relationship. It was very volatile. They fought a lot. The clothes were often thrown out onto the road. And the nature of their text messages they were pretty pretty nasty. He told detectives he hadn't seen Ray that morning, nor since. The relationship history was a red flag. The boyfriend, a potential suspect. Further analysis of Ray's phone data reveal a more complicated web. She had multiple cell phones. Initially, we sought the records for at least six or seven of them. She was a very busy person, travelling from Hamilton to Auckland all the time. Ray Portman's job was really to distribute contact NT to people that would turn it into uh, methamphetamine, to uplift money from those people. Identifying her associates could reveal her whereabouts. But like Ray, her contacts use multiple disposable prepay burner phones changing numbers and names to avoid detection. We've got to really analyse what is being said and then do further checks to identify an associate. It is a lot of work and it takes time. 
Police were also investigating Ray's life in Auckland, where she spent a lot of time with her close friends, Nikki and Dean Addison. They rented two units in a block of 10 in Papakura. Dean, he had a panel beating shop, polishing car wheels and that sort of thing. It was Nikki who raised the alarm with Ray's mum, saying she hadn't seen her for about two weeks. Nikki and Ray, they were into high school together, so they've been friends pretty much all their lives. And these two women called themselves sisters, so they, they were that close. The Addisons lived above one of the units. Usually, Ray was in close contact, but they hadn't seen her for about a fortnight. Adding to their concern, Dean knew Ray had been assaulted about a month earlier. He had picked her up from Middlemore Hospital. She was in a bit of a mess from an assault that occurred. The inquiries into why she was admitted led us to another group of people who were involved in drug taking and other criminal matters. While in hospital, Ray received some unexpected news. She was pregnant. News she had shared with only Nikki and Dean Addison. Police very quickly have multiple lines of investigation in Hamilton and Auckland in their search for missing pregnant woman, Ray Portman. But every lead seems to uncover another layer of criminal activity. Dean Addison had had this, his legitimate business, um, but uh, really he was selling methamphetamine. Um, uh, from that unit, and he was selling lots of it. And he had been doing a deal with Ray to get more. Ray's focus of activity towards Dean in those last few days was about the debt of about $14,000 that he owed her for a set that she had given him and his job was to you know, turn that over and she would take that cut. Ray now needed to collect that payment. As it got closer to that 20th, and on the 20th, um, her tone had definitely changed. You could see that Dean was actively trying to avoid contact with her because he knew he owed her some money. With Ray not being paid by Dean, that would leave her owing the money. And we did know that she was connected with gangs. The repercussions of her not paying what is owed to her boss, anything could happen to her. So what happened? Did Dean put Ray's life at risk by not paying the $14,000? Or maybe her disappearance was linked to one of the other scenarios police were investigating. Ray was quite a feisty person. You know, she had to be in the, in the type of life she led. Everywhere the investigation led, there was another suspect and another line of inquiry. We started speaking to all of her associates and friends. We could see that it could be any number of people that may have headed in for Ray Portman. As the investigation grew, police also began looking into another possibility. Could Ray be hatching her own plan? Her data was telling us that she was gathering quite a bit of money together. On analysis of her text messages, she was talking with others that, you know, this, this could be the big one for me. Could have meant that, you know, this could be it for me and I can get out of this, this type of life. Did a pregnant Ray Portman deliberately disappear from her criminal life? Or had her criminal life caught up with her? Thirty-three-year-old Ray Portman's belongings were found at an Auckland motel, but she and her car have totally disappeared. Police have a growing list of leads, 
starting with her best friends, Nikki and Dean Addison. Dean owes Ray a large sum of money for drugs. Police are now looking closely at who and what is going on at the two units rented by the Addisons. Dean had a couple of what we'd call lackeys um, working for him. These boys wanted to be like him. They looked up to him. They were both out to do whatever Dean wanted them to do. Another associate who lives in the Addison's second unit, right next door, was already known to police. So Friday Chihuahua is a headhunter and has family ties in that gang and had a reputation for being a standover man. Interest in this group escalates when one of their friends comes forward reporting a disturbing conversation with one of the lackeys, Lee Rigby. She had met uh, Lee Rigby on the side of the road in Jury and Lee had spilled out a incoherent, disjointed account of Ray's kidnapping. Friday was there and Ray Portman was there uh, tied up and that Dean had got Lee and Friday to uh, teach her a lesson and take her away. Unsure of Rigby's story, she did a little detective work herself and discovered a potential clue in Friday Te Awa's unit, a clue which she took to the police. She remembers seeing a receipt for Scrap Palace and that was on the floor in Friday's room. Scrap Palace was easily located, a scrap metal yard in Hamilton. They went there and the owner said, look, every car that comes in here for scrap, they're scrapped and crushed the next day. But a bit of stroke of luck, he liked the mag wheels on, this, um, on the Astena, so he put it off to the side so that he could take the wheels off and put them away before he scrapped the car. But he just hadn't got round to it. Even more helpful was their CCTV and that actually showed Friday Tower selling the vehicle for scrap. The footage is very good. It even shows him removing the, the uh, number plate off the front as he left the uh, premises. Why was Friday Te Awa disposing of Ray's car? Did this mean there was some truth in the Rigby kidnap story? And would the car hold any clues? We're interested to know whether we could identify anything that might indicate whether she'd been in the vehicle, whether she'd been injured in the vehicle. The car was thoroughly examined, with no obvious signs of injury, such as blood staining found. But two items were removed for further testing, a duvet inner and a painter's drop sheet. We suspect that someone may have been put in a vehicle, the possibility they may have been wrapped or bundled in clothing or bedding uh, might help us in that investigation. Some hairs were found and removed for analysis. We found a really small, faint blood stain on one area of the duvet, uh, almost too small and too faint to see, but confirmed with the presence of the chemical test we used to indicate that blood was present. He also removed a section of masking tape. That tape might have been used to bind someone. Perhaps the person ripped it with their fingers. Maybe they put it in their mouth to bite it, to cut the ends. And we can sample that for any cellular material from that individual. We're here outside, uh, Police are trying to locate Lee Rigby regarding the alleged kidnapping account, but he seems to have gone to ground. If you're trying to find someone who's, who's on the run, you focus on family, you focus on food, and you focus on girlfriends. I spent quite a bit of time with his family, with a few people who, who knew him. Um, no one knew where he was. I managed to find an ex-girlfriend. And then through our police database, there were a number of old addresses he'd stayed in, in rural Takanini and Ardmore. So I started knocking on doors. As the search continues, the items found in Ray's car are now tested for saliva. Why did you do that? Saliva is a really good target for us when we're looking for DNA, where an item may have been in contact with someone's mouth or there's small bits of spit that someone might project out of their mouth. Also, people might lick their fingers or hands and then touch their clothing or another item and transfer saliva. So how do you test for saliva? If there was saliva present on here, we wouldn't be able to see it, but we can use uh, some Fatabas paper, which is this piece of it here. You call that Fadabas paper? Yeah, that's the name of the test paper that's impregnated with the dye here, the blue dye that allows us to test for saliva. Now, when saliva reacts with this paper, it'll sever the bond between the blue dye and starch, which is holding it in place. 
So I can place that over an area that I'm interested in. And then we just moisten that area with some sterile water. This test mimics what happens in our mouths all the time. There's an enzyme in our saliva called amylase. Its job is to break down starch, part of our digestion process. If there's saliva on the drop sheet, it'll react with the starch in the test paper and the blue dye will be transferred. Does the saliva have to be new? Saliva will last really well on an item. Once the stain's dry, it will last for months or up to years and we can test those items and see if we can detect the amylase present at that stage. Why is it such a good source of DNA? Saliva's a really good source of DNA because each time that you have a little bit of saliva come out of your mouth, with that liquid are cells from the inside of the mouth. Now they're called buccal cells and they come from your cheeks and gums inside your mouth. There's a really high concentration of buccal cells in saliva, so a lot of cells means a lot of DNA. What's happening there, Dion? It's turning blue. The blue dye was on the underside of the papers being released and it's transitioning through the filter paper. We can see that here. So that means in this area, we've got amylase that was present in a saliva stain on the drop sheet. Positive result areas are cut out and sent for DNA analysis. In this case, Dion found two small areas of saliva on the drop sheet. And what did you find? We found some human DNA in those samples, but not enough human DNA to get a DNA profile to say who it could have come from. Analysis of the hairs and the small blood stain found on other items didn't turn up anything relevant either. It seemed the car was a dead end. Police still had the witness story of Lee Rigby being involved in the kidnapping, if he could be found. Next morning, I hit the road again with a few other detectives, uh, knocked on the right door in rural Takanini, a massive barn-type building. I remember knocking on the door, calling out to Lee. There's no answer for, for a number of minutes. The door opened just a crack. I saw uh, Lee's face for a split second, and then he closed the door and locked it. I just kept voice appealing him, just calling out, Lee come out and everything will be all right, it's the police here. Um, and it took about 15 minutes, um, and he finally came out the front door. On the way back to the station, he told me he was having nightmares about what he'd seen, and he couldn't get those visions out of his head. And I was just reassuring him, he'll feel a lot better if he told me everything um, that he'd seen. If by getting it off his chest, um, all those nightmares will probably go away. What nightmare story will Rigby tell, and will it lead to the missing woman? I interviewed Lee for about six hours. It became clear quite early that he was criminally involved in race kidnapping. Very briefly, he was able to say that day had had beers with Dean at the yard, had gone home and received a text from Nikki that night to come back to Makita Place. So he did. Dean told him that Ray was next door and upstairs with Friday and for him to go and help Friday. He was shocked. He walked upstairs and saw Ray was uh, tied up and bound. He was then told by Friday to assist him to carry her downstairs and uh, into her vehicle. Dean was present, had given them some money to get petrol. He was then told that Friday wasn't going to hurt Ray and that Friday was going to teach her a lesson. I guess it was his way of not having to repay that $14,000. Was to have his standover man teach her a lesson and, and hope that she goes away. Friday led the way in his yellow ute down the southern motorway. They got off the motorway at the Bombays to get gas. That's when Lee thought, oh, this is it, we're going to leave her here. That's it, we'll drive back. When they carried on driving further south, Lee was telling me he became very worried. Lee had thoughts of driving away and not following Friday, but Friday being a dangerous person, he was scared and was just hoping for the best. They carried on towards Nauwahia, 
where they stopped at an address there, who were associates of Tiawa's. They stayed there for a while, drinking and having a smoke. During that time, Lee was often asked to go out to the car and see if he's okay, as in Ray Portman, who was at that point tied up and bound in the back of her own car. From there, Rigby says they went to some industrial area and it was there that they pulled up on the side of the road. And that's when things started really getting difficult and hard for Lee during the interview. He was struggling to put it into words. I remember him staring sort of past me. It looked like he was playing it through his head again, like watching a program or, or a movie. They were parked at the industrial area. Friday walked up to the Black Majestina boot and told Lee, if this is a bit too hard for you, then um, walk away. Lee said he saw Friday put Ray's neck in the crook of his elbow as if he was cradling or holding onto her neck. Lee's next recollection was Friday taking the tape off Ray's mouth and that Ray's complexion was now grey as if the life had drained out of her. And Lee said he hoped that she was just unconscious. And then Friday told Lee to drive the Black Mass Rustina again and to follow him. And that's when they drove back to the family address that they'd been to earlier in the night. And that's where the Black Master Astina was parked in the corner of the section. Then they left in the yellow ute, and it was on the drive back to Auckland that Lee asked Friday um, about Ray, and Friday's answer was something like, um, don't worry about it, she's gone. And that's when it dawned on Lee that she was dead. During that trip, um, Friday also threatened him not to tell anyone or he'd, he'd kill him. Lee Rigby told a compelling story, but was it just a story to lessen his own role, or was it true? And if Friday Te Awa had killed her, where was the evidence? Investigators started their search at the units where the alleged kidnap began. We were looking potentially for an area where she may have been assaulted. We found one small visible blood stain. But nothing further doesn't mean that an assault hasn't occurred, it just means that we haven't found any blood standing. Without blood loss, there is little evidence to prove an attack. Investigators extended the search to outside. We got a bit lucky there. The outside skip bin hadn't been picked up. That was searched. Inside the skip bin was Ray's uh, Mazda Stina, uh, number plates for a car. They'd been cut up into small little pieces. That was a key piece of evidence because that physically linked Ray's car back to Marquito Place. There was another link with Marquito Place and Ray's car. Tape was found that matched the tape they'd recovered from the drop sheet. But it's common masking tape, not particularly significant, until ESR scientist Sally Coulson had a closer look. There was something else on the tape, wasn't there? Yes, there was. So both pieces of tape had multiple paint fragments attached to them of a huge variety of colours. This is sort of unusual. Having such a wide range of paint colours on there means that it had to have come from somewhere that had lots of different types of paint present, such as maybe an artist's studio or a panel beater's. The paint colours were catalogued and both pieces of tape appear to have the same red colour, but the fragments were minuscule. Too small for significant analysis? They're really small, I can't even see them. And it's a matter of picking the paint fragment off the masking tape and then putting it onto this diamond anvil cell. And so for analysis, it needs to be on this diamond, but it also needs to be really smooth and flat. So we use a little roller to roll out the paint fragment. So this is now all ready for analysis. Can I have a look? Yes. 
So it really is a small little smudge of red paint. And if I, can I just grab and see if I can move that around just to get an idea of, oh, the scale. That's so small, it's like a, a bit of dust. It is minuscule, isn't it? I mean, you've got to have an incredibly steady hand. Yes, they're very small paint fragments, but we can still analyse ones that are that small. So where does that then go? So we take this to an instrument next door and we can analyse the chemical composition. First, the detector is cooled by liquid nitrogen. So this is an FTIR, and that stands for Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. It uses infrared to analyse the chemical structure of the paint sample. That paint will absorb certain wavelengths, and this will give us a chemical signature so we can tell the chemical composition of this paint. And what did you discover in this case? So I can show you the results. The red paint from one sample is shown as a blue line, and the red paint from the other sample is a red line. Wow! They're almost exactly the same. Yes, and that's what we'd expect if the two paints have come from the same source, that they would have the same profile. The tiny specks of paint matched and were an unusual alkyd paint commonly used on cars. It created stronger evidence that the drop sheet in Ray's car came from Addison's units. There were definite connections between Ray's disappearance and Marquito Place, but just who and how many people were involved, police weren't sure. Dean Addison could have done it, or really Bigby himself could have killed Ray Portman. Because at this stage, we only have him saying that. The Addisons have been interviewed several times by police. They initially claimed not to have seen Ray for days before she went missing. But Ray's phone data suggested she was with Nikki at Marquito Place on the night she disappeared. We were quite suspicious of them um, and then what they were up to. Police had a group of suspects, but were unsure about exactly what roles they played. We just have to be very careful about how we go about our investigation to ensure that we get it right. It's nine weeks since Ray Portman went missing. Police have a witness account of her murder, but no evidence to corroborate it and still no clues to where her body is. Witness Lee Rigby is re-interviewed, seeking more information. The key piece of information that Lee didn't tell me when I first interviewed him was that Friday had actually put some sort of strop or something around Ray's neck and he'd got some sort of um, metal bar or something similar to that and he'd, he'd wound the strop around her uh, neck, obviously strangling her. A harrowing detail, but this could lead to corroborating evidence should Ray's body ever be found and locating her remains the key. And Ray's body is always a key piece of forensic evidence that can help us uh, tie in a killer. And without that, we really couldn't um, interview Friday. We, we weren't in a strong position to do that. You can't just disappear. Nobody, nobody disappears. There has to be a body in some form, somewhere. Her mother, Rebecca, agrees to take part in a police media conference in an effort to get new information. So I just ask for that person who's out there, who knows where she is, to do the right thing and just let us know so we can bring Ray home. Ray is actually four months pregnant. Um, so not am I only grieving the loss of my daughter, I'm actually in the position where I'm actually grieving my first grandchild. For the first time, the public is told Ray was pregnant, a fact known to very few people. Um, it, uh, uh, more and more information started to flow into the inquiry. One was that there was a rumour that Friday had been driving around with Ray under a mattress on the back of his yellow ute and he 
be driving around town, um, Hamilton and, and South Auckland, like that. Another phase in the operation was focusing on the Waikato and identify a place where he may have taken her. Police were also analysing Friday Te Awa's movements from his phone data. In fact, on the night of Ray's alleged murder, Te Awa drove from Addison's unit in Papakura to Te Rapa near Hamilton and then back again. And it's recorded at all the south sites to Hamilton and back. With CCTV capturing him stopping for gas on his way, again confirming Rigby's account. But were Rigby and Te Awa acting alone or under Dean's orders? Real telling text was one Friday sent to Dean Addison. He says to Dean, hey my bro, we are on the way home, everything's sweet, see you soon, okay. Um, you know, that to me was quite a, quite a telling text. Investigators had enough to arrest Friday Te Awa and charge him with the kidnap of Ray Portman, but not enough for murder. Friday was interviewed and he really didn't say anything. And when it came to putting uh, the main, main events to him, he uh, declined to comment on those. Police still need evidence to prove Ray's murder. And in a coordinated operation involving ESR, they search several properties, including a house in Hamilton where Te Awa has been staying. They're interested in looking at this address for anything that may have come from Ms Portman, that may enable them to establish an association between the suspect and the deceased. There are a couple of mattresses located in the garage at that address. We're looking for the presence of hairs and fibres that we could then examine at a later date to see if they could have come from Ms Portman. The ute was seized from the property and examined by ESR. So when we started looking at the back of the vehicle, inside the tray area was a plastic liner. And that black plastic liner had actually been painted with matte black paint. So we looked at the surface of that to determine whether or not there was anything that that paint had been covering. We also removed the plastic liner from the rear of the ute to see if anything um, may have been present underneath the plastic liner. No trace of Ray Portman could be detected in the vehicle. On the same day, a second police team executed a warrant on the Naruwahia address Te Awa and Rigby had visited the night of the kidnapping. They confirmed the visit to the address by Te Awa and Rigby. They were very shocked and upset about what they'd become involved in. They had no idea the car left at their house had a body concealed in its boot. In fact, they remember their own children had gone through the car the day after Te Awa had left. But they went through the glove box and, um, and, and under the seats and down the side of the seats looking for, for money, but uh, neither of them looked in the boot of the car and Ray probably would have been there. Friday gave the woman there a pair of black Nike running shoes. And those Nike running shoes were sitting on the front doorstep when we arrived at their house. And they were Ray's. This is the first physical link to Ray and the kidnap story. But what they didn't have was her or any evidence of her murder. The following day, police execute another warrant at a large rural property in South Auckland. Police tracking Te Awa's movements have noted his frequent visits here, both before and after Ray's disappearance. Initial focus is a large shed and makeshift bedroom inside. What we located inside the main makeshift room, inside a set of cupboards, was a brown Louis Vuitton handbag. That itself was specifically listed on the search warrant, so straight away uh, we knew that we had located something quite significant. Inside the Louis Vuitton handbag were a number of items as well. An actual key to a room, which had a yellow key tag. Room 11 jumped out at me uh, because I was aware of the fact that she had failed to check out of a motel room, uh, and that room itself was room 11 as well but that soon would be overshadowed. An even larger breakthrough made by searchers working outside. 
Items linked to missing woman Ray Portman have already been found at a rural South Auckland property. When investigators come across a pit of rubbish bags that raises their suspicions. It's the middle of winter and they're just floating in a, in a pool of water as this pit had filled up. I remember standing there and just saying to Mark, get the specialist search guys down here to drain that and get all those rubbish bags out and let's see what's in there. It was quite an unpleasant scene to deal with. The smell was quite uh, significant. As they moved the rubbish bags, they describe it as a, a bubbling, a bubbling noise and this large blue plastic popped up. The blue material stuck out because everything else around it was your, your standard black rubbish bag. The blue item was removed so it could be examined further. We worked with police to quite quickly try and identify whether it was just another item of rubbish that had been disposed or whether in fact it was the body of Miss Portman. We made a small incision and by pulling the edges apart, we were able to see items of clothing and what appeared to be part of a body. I'd best describe the atmosphere as a bit of sweet moment. Sweet in a sense that we're relieved that we've located Ray Portman. Bitter in a sense, seeing the way that she's actually been disposed of. So it was a very sombre moment. It's been three months since the night police believe Ray was murdered. Will the science of pathology reveal any clues as to how she died and who killed her? The body was received at the mortuary, still wrapped as it has been at the scene. The body itself was wrapped in multiple layers. On the outer surface, there was a blue inflatable pool that had been collapsed. Within that, there was a, a painter's drop sheet, and then beneath that was a blanket. After the outer was removed, many more items were discovered to have been wrapped around Ray Portman's head and neck. Each item carefully removed until they reach a final layer. And there was blue duct tape over that nose and mouth area, wound many times around the head. Her body was examined for any sign of physical injury, including the neck area. There was none. But there are a variety of reasons for that. The body had undergone a type of decomposition that you see when a body is immersed in water. You lose the top layers of skin. It dissolves away, so to speak. That's the area where you may see the injury in cases of a ligature around the neck or that garroting history that we had. Another reason is what's been used as a ligature. So something that is broad distributes the pressure over a, a larger area. So you may actually not see much in the way of a mark compared to something perhaps like a wire where the pressure is distributed over a thinner area. Ray Portman had been tied up, still bound when her body was discovered. That fact may also have contributed to the lack of injuries. People tend to fight back when you put something around their neck. So there's bruising, they're trying to reach and scratch and pull the ligature away. She can't do that because her hands are tied. These are all reasons that mean there may be nothing to see on the neck, but it doesn't mean that nothing happened. So the cause of death was ruled to be mechanical asphyxia. And what that means is there's something physically impeding the ability to get air into the body. There is more than sufficient obstruction to her airways from the bindings, from the wrapping, from the history of the garroting to say, this is what's resulted in her death. During the post-mortem, a small piece of evidence was discovered. It was found on top of Ray's clothing inside the exterior wrappings. Because it was contained within those layers, it looked like it couldn't have got in there while she was in the rubbish pit. This small piece of evidence could be vital. That might allow us to link where she had been killed or where her body had been wrapped to try and make an association to a particular person or an address. The question was asked, is there any particle board like this at the farm? And the, the answer to that was, yes, there is. There's lots of it. Different sizes. It was all scattered along the back side of a shed there. All of those items came into the lab for us to examine. 
ESR scientist Ben O'Leary examined the particle board, which I assumed would be through some sort of chemical analysis. But it turned out that wasn't possible. And that's because the way the stuff is actually made, that each sheet is pretty similar. It's very, very generic and it's made and um, mass produced. With no way to differentiate between pieces using chemical analysis, the only other option was to try and fit all of the pieces back together and see if the small piece found with Ray belonged. In the demonstration we've set up, we're using about a third of the number of pieces that came in. So what were you thinking when you looked down, you've got 350 different pieces of particle board. What were you thinking? My initial thought was this is um, a needle in a haystack situation and we didn't have much hope of getting a result. Ben started as we are now, up on a ladder looking down. So the advantage of being up high is you, you get that overview, you see things that you wouldn't see at ground level and see some correspondence in each shape and think, okay, that piece, maybe that goes together. In my case, it was mould growing on the boards, so I would have put those together as one group and started working on those and trying to piece those together. Progress was very slow initially, mainly figuring out what side went up and down. This doubled his options, so 350 pieces became 700. I can see two bits over there that look like they may go together. I'm going to get down and have a, have a try. I select two large pieces which look a real obvious fit, but it's not that simple. Looks pretty good initially. Um, you haven't got the correspondence of any paint transfer across. Do you know how many actual sheets of board you had? I had no idea. It could have been 100 broken up, could have been one entire board. I didn't have a clue. So it really is like doing a massive jigsaw puzzle. Um, probably the hardest jigsaw puzzle you could imagine. Surf series is so random, and finding that match, that's what gives it the power of this little examination. How long did this part take you? This took the um, majority of two weeks, probably slightly over. So this is one of the sheets of particle board we managed to put together. Um, and this area here is the area of importance. We found the piece from Ray fitted in nicely. That small little piece of board fitted that single sheet? Essentially, yes. Finding a correspondence between that broken piece and all those other pieces of particle board was a real surprise, a real highlight of the case. Finding that connection provides a way of saying that we know where Ms Portman was at the time that she was being wrapped. There was only one person who had links to that property. Friday is, of all of those people, Friday is the only one that has a connection to that farm. He's taken her there and probably hidden her behind that shed. And in his wrapping of her body, he's collected this piece of that particle board from the hundreds of pieces that were there. Now police had enough evidence to lay charges for Ray's kidnap and murder. Te Awa denied his role but was found guilty. The sentencing judge described Te Awa as extremely dangerous, detached from reality with a disturbing lack of humanity. He was sentenced to life imprisonment to serve a minimum of 20 years. But he hadn't acted alone. Detectives had noted a curious fact with Ray's phone after she disappeared. A lot of her associates were called, trying to call her. But what was probably more interesting is that the two people that always portray to everybody that they were her best friends, which is Nikki and Dean Addison, they never called her phone once. And it's clear the reason for that is they knew. The judge, in sentencing Dean Addison, said in directing the kidnap, knew he was putting Ray Portman and her unborn child at risk. For his role in the kidnap and drug offences, he was sentenced to 12 years to serve a minimum of six. Lee Rigby received a four-year sentence for his role in the kidnapping. He had provided crucial evidence against Te Awa and Addison. He did a bad thing, and all he could do to put it right was to give the best evidence he could at trial, and he certainly did that. Ray's my only daughter, and it was only the other night I was thinking, well, oh, my grandchild would have been coming up for getting ready for school, almost. Yeah, so, yeah, that is a um, really sad, I think it's really sad. 
there are two main points that really stick out for the whole team. And that is one, we were able to return the body of Ray Portman to her family. And two, that we were able to bring the persons responsible for Ray's death to justice. And justice was served. Thanks to a tireless team of police investigators and the detailed work of scientists, a missing woman was finally found and vital questions were answered.